This episode contains material that might be triggering for some. If you need to stop the podcast at any time to take care of yourself, please do so. If you need support, you can call the 24-7 National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. Dialectical Behavior Therapy was created in the 1980s by Marsha Linehan in Seattle, Washington. Today, DBT is taught all over the world. We're two therapists who believe everyone can benefit from DBT skills. I'm Kate. I'm Michelle. And And this this is is DBT and Me. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Q&A 22. 22? Dang. 22. Though I was looking the other day, Michelle, and I I don't know why, I just hadn't really kept track, but we have 91 episodes. It's pretty bananas. I don't know what we're going to do when we get to 100. I know. I feel like we ought to do something special. I don't know what, but I like commemorating things. Yeah, me too. Our 100th episode ought to be something fun. I like milestones. Yeah, right? maybe we'll post about it in the group and see if people have ideas for how we celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, like but this is Q&A 22. Yes. And I think you are leading us off. I do get to lead us off. All right. So this was an email we got from a listener. And the email reads, I'm a 56-year-old lesbian and I've had super intense emotions and self-harm urges at times in my life. And at other times, they have normalized for a few years, allowing me to become an occupational therapist and speech language therapist, get married, adopt special needs children, and hold a steady job. But how I functioned better and how I am now functioning worse are a mystery to me. I seem to fit the criteria for dependent personality disorder better than borderline personality disorder, but I have traits of both and I have bipolar too. The one thing I have in my head that is very central to me, but I've never met anyone else my age who does it is, I idolize people, women older than me. Maybe I want them to be my mother or big sister. Maybe I want to turn into them. Maybe I want them to be my lover, but certainly to be my rescuer. So my brain will pick out people, coworkers, actors in a movie, nurses, and especially all the female therapists I've ever had, and I will become very sad because I long to be with them, because I want to help them with anything, even volunteer menial jobs, because I want to know about their histories and personal lives, because I want them to adopt me and just hold me on a couch in a sunbeam until I fall asleep, knowing they will still be there when I wake up. My therapist says I have a hole in me, and instead of trying to fill it myself, I go around asking women, will you fill this? Will you fill this? And no one can. This sometimes becomes very debilitating because I think in part I cut and attempt suicide because of my idols, wanting them to be concerned about me, and again, rescue me. Is there anything in DBT that could help me work this obsession through? Oh, okay. So this is my notes. I have this litany of DBT skills, and yeah. I'm hoping that doesn't end up being overwhelming. <laughs> uh, so first of all, these are this is a menu. Maybe you don't have to do all of these necessarily, but um, first of all, I totally get that. I don't know. Maybe it's not exactly the same, but I I don't know. The whole email just gives me this sense of yearning. And, like, yearning for a thing that you don't have or have never had, right? This sort of sense of that. And that that at least resonates a lot with me. Uh, So a few things, listener, that I thought might be able to help that are DBT-related. One is radical acceptance of so many different aspects of this, right? Radically accepting that you have this hole in yourself. Radically accepting that you have this urge to have an older woman fill it. You know, radically accepting how hard this can be and the sadness that could come up, right? There's lots of opportunities for radical acceptance um, with, again, uh, you know, putting the caveat out there that radical, radical acceptance does not mean laying back and deciding that nothing can or will ever change. It's a starting point, right? You have to accept what is before you can move towards it. And I think, just from how self-aware you sound in this email, <clears throat> you're making good strides in that direction already, mm-hmm. right? So radical acceptance 
really diving into that could be very helpful, I think. Uh, another one is check the facts, right? What is this person in my life? What is their actual role? What can I or can't I expect? You know, what is the catastrophe, right? You've talked about being sad because these things can't happen, but what's, if anything, is the real cost to those things not happening, right? There's a lot of different spaces, I think, also in sort of the scenarios that you describe where check the facts might be able to help you, you know, I, I don't know how to put this. Uh, with check the facts, sometimes the conclusion is the most important part. Like, okay, this thing does or does not fit the facts. But I think sometimes the process can be really helpful, right? Just making yourself sit down and be like, what am I assuming? What is the catastrophe that I'm imagining? What is the, right? Because we don't usually... I don't know, metacognate in that way. Right? We don't necessarily think about our thinking in such a way. And I, I, I experience check the facts as being very helpful in that regard, right? Whatever the conclusion may or may not be, sometimes the process itself of going through check the facts, and in this case, I would mean like using the worksheet. Oh, excuse me, of course I on right now. <laughs> I felt it coming I before we my start. throat, so. Ugh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, right, the process, worksheet, you know, whole nine yards might be very helpful as well. Um, Michelle probably will giggle because I don't know if there's ever a time I don't think this is helpful. I put down self-soothe, right, because I don't know, so much of what you described just makes me want to, you know, hold my heart, right? It seems very soft, mm -hmm. right, tender kind of feelings of, again, of yearning, of sadness, of need that's not being met. Um, and so I think self-soothe can step in there to be comforting and a way to comfort yourself. Uh, and then the last DBT thing that I'll say is potentially uh, accepts and or improve some distress tolerance distraction related skills. Um, this specifically ties into maybe some of the self-harm urges or suicidality, right? Doing things to distract yourself from those urges. So actually thinking more, I guess, ride the wave may also be applicable to your situation. Um, and also just anytime you're uh, perseverating, ruminating, right, really churning over a thing over and over and over again in your mind, uh, accepts and improve can help sort of knock that train off of tracks a bit, uh, give you a chance to ch change gears. How many different metaphors can I use in one <laughs> sentence? <laughs> Uh, so those are those are the DBT related things. The the last thing that I'll say that is not DBT related is, and again I'm I'm going out on a limb here, but a lot of that need, and especially since it's focused specifically on older women, makes me think that it might be coming from a kind of younger part of yourself. Um, oddly enough, I think this sounds similar to something you and I, Michelle, talked about last Q and A. But um, you might try doing a visualization where you talk to the part of yourself like where that hole was created. Like try and think back, when do you think that hole opened up in yourself or in your life? And have a conversation with that part. See what that part needs and you might be able to enter into a conversation that allows you to do more around filling it for yourself rather than needing all of this external input in order to attempt to do that. So yeah, and despite the fact that I cannot do them at all, I believe in the power of visualizations. <laughs> Uh, and you might find some help doing something like that. And that would be a place, you might ask your therapist about that if they like leading visualizations. Your therapist might be able to lead you through something that could be helpful there too, since it sounds like you're working with someone. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are my thoughts. What about you, Michelle? Yeah, so Kate did a great job listing a plethora of DBT specific <laughs> from. So I'm not going to talk about anything DBT specific <laughs> in my response. I am going to echo some of the things that Kate was just saying, um, <clears throat> more or less though. The first thing, though, that I want to start off with is saying, like, this is not as uncommon as you might think. Mm -mm. Um, I can think of one client on my caseload in particular who also really looks to women in her life to fill a void that was left basically by her mother. And I think we think about this kind of generally socially. We think a lot of times about daddy issues or labeling things in that way. But I think it is not uncommon for a variety of reasons 
for us to gravitate towards a certain type of person in our lives to try to fill a certain gap that was left, which is kind of what you said your therapist is getting at with you is saying, hey, this is what it seems like is that you're really looking to these women to feel, to fill something. Um, and I don't think that's an uncommon experience. It's going to look unique to everyone, but it's definitely a thing that happens. And so to really generalize here, because we don't know enough about you or your life story to be able to pinpoint why this might be happening for you specifically, but generally when people are looking to others to fill a gap or having fantasies about like their ideal parents or their ideal sibling or their ideal partner or whoever, whoever it might be, it's because there was a disruption in attachment somewhere, somewhere in that person's life where they did not get from that relationship what they needed. They did not have the relationship with their mother or their father that they really wanted to have. They did not have a relationship, say, with, say with peers. I'll hear this a lot. People are like, I had no friends growing up. So their friendship attachments were disrupted or never really had a chance to even start. <coughs> Excuse me. Or whatever it is, when we have a disruption in attachment, we're kind of hardwired as human beings to want to repair that disruption and to find a healthy attachment in some way. And it really sounds to me like that's what you're wanting here. Oh my gosh, I need to cough again. <laughs> <laughs> I have something Sorry. in my throat. Take a drink of water. I may need to. One second. I will. I, I actually, <laughs> I, I drank a little bit of water while you were talking, Kate. I totally spilled all over myself, which was funny. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, I had just refilled up my water bottle. So it was like super full and I forgot. And so I spilled all Whoopsie. myself. But it's okay. It's already drying because it's still pretty warm. Okay. Maybe that will help. But yeah, I mean, attachment disruptions happen in many different forms to many different people. And in terms of where do you go from here, like what, what do you do with that knowledge? I think when that happens, it can lay this groundwork for us believing that what, what love is, and we talk about this broadly, I would say almost universally, we talk about how like love is give and take, right? Love is this thing where we give to another person and they give to us. And that can almost paint out love to be like this transactional relationship, which one could make an argument that it is to some degree or another. You get mm -hmm. something by being in connection with this other person and maybe they get something from being in connection with you like yes at its base level that is what love and relationships of all kinds can be but i would say that the healthiest kinds of love and the healthiest kind of relationships are ones in which both people are able to be aware of what their needs are and to, in a way that is healthy and honoring of themselves and another person, they're able to ask for help if they need it, but like not expect help. Mm. Like, I don't know if this is making sense because this, this is a big idea that I'm talking about in a way, but it really is, I think, about believing that in order for someone to love you, you don't have to do anything for them. And I hear that throughout this email of you're like, if I do X, Y, and Z, then they'll love me. Or I want them to do X, Y, and Z for me. Mm -hmm. And what it would be like to have a connection with another person when there are not those expectations. It doesn't mean you don't ever help each other out. It doesn't mean... 
you know, that's why we form connections with other people is because if we were to all live truly in isolation, we wouldn't have survived as a species this long. Nope. <laughs> it wouldn't nope. have happened. We need other people to survive and to help us in the areas that we may struggle with. But we don't want that to be the basis of relationships, if that makes sense. We want it to just be, I'm in a relationship with this other person because I just love who they are and they love who I am. And we don't have these expectations of one another of what we need to be doing for the other person or like me filling in the gaps in their life and them filling in the gaps in mine. I don't think it's always great to lead with that when we're forming relationships with other people. And this is also very, very common that there are those in this world who get their fulfillment from trying to rescue other people. There are those in this world who only feel loved when they are being rescued by others. Um, this is very common. And so that's what it kind of sounds like to me might be going on here a little bit with you. And I guess all of that is to say, not that there's probably any real concrete advice in there, but I'm so glad you're in therapy and that you're working on this. And I think it would be fascinating to look at what it, what it means for you to have connections with other people where you're not looking for that. Maybe with men in your life, if you notice that in your relationships with men, um, that you're not looking for them to fill those needs for you in that way or for you to fill those needs for them. That could be fascinating to see how just different those relationships feel with the males that you have in your life than with the females you have in your life. But yeah, we just want to be really mindful and really cautious of, oh, we came together, me and this other person, we came together because I saw that they needed my help and I jumped in to help them. That's why we came together or vice versa. I was in need and they jumped in to rescue me. We just want to be cautious when that's how relationships form. And it's totally possible for relationships to form on a foundation of just kind of like mutual appreciation and respect rather than on this foundation of trying to like fix or help each other. So those are my thoughts. Again, mm. nothing DBT in there. But just kind of, what, kind of my take on what might be going on. So I loaded a part on the DBT to begin with. Hey, so that fine. works for me. <laughs> <sighs> oh, okay, so this next one reads, says, I find I am a really nice person to other people. Understanding, offering lots of praise, and offering a helping hand when I can. I find, however, that I, excuse me, I almost can't praise myself. I can notice achievements in the moment, but don't feel good about it. On the flip side, I can guilt trip myself and mentally punish myself really fast and hard. I also notice that I can't remember my achievements unless there's something negative to balance it out. I was talking to my partner last night and he was telling a friend everything he had worked on and improved over the past year with lockdown, and I couldn't think of anything good that I had done. He listed all these great things I had done and I had completely forgotten the majority of them. Is there anything you could recommend to start practicing self-praise and love that my brain can't sabotage? Hmm. That last part, mm, which the listener put in parentheses, right? That my brain can't sabotage. <laughs> Good luck. Um, but I don't want to take anything of what Kate's about to say. <laughs> since it sounds <laughs> like she's going to address that in particular. Um, I don't know. The, the thing, well, now there's this whole other thing that's coming up for me. So I don't know if this applies to you, listener, or not, and I didn't write it down as part of my notes, but sometimes for some people, if you grew up in a family that set a really high bar for you, B's were not good enough in school, you needed to get A's kind of a thing. I don't know if that's how you grew up at all. Maybe that has nothing to do with your background or your childhood. But thinking like what you describe can be very common with people who grew up in households that were extremely like high achieving households who were kind of all or nothing, you know, black or white thinking in terms of like you either pass with flying colors or you're a failure. And there's a whole lot of gray area. 
And that's kind of what it almost sounds like to me here is that you're having a hard time recognizing the gray area. Because especially if your partner was like, I did this big thing during lockdown and this big thing during lockdown and you didn't do anything that in your mind is on the same level, you're going to probably just feel like that might negate any small or little things you did likely do. So it can be really easy to compare yourself to other people and it can be really easy to think that even if you are doing well, that it's not good enough if you did grow up in a household like that. Um, so, but I hear, I hear a little bit of that in here. So the first thing that came to mind for me, which is a very simple idea and is kind of a form of opposite action in a way, if I had to put it under a DBT skill, is every day think of or write something down that you are proud of yourself for. I don't care how big or small. I, I do not care. And I do not care if you repeat. Um, <laughs> like set, set the bar really low and start thinking of something every day that you did. Even if it wouldn't typically classify, like you use this word achievement multiple times throughout your email. Even if you would qualify it as an achievement, because I, I don't know, it sounds like a big thing to me, <laughs> but recognizing something that you did well, because there is something every day. I feel pretty confident in saying that. I don't know you, but I feel pretty confident in saying that because I just kind of believe that universally about all of us is that every day we do something well. Um, to some degree or another. So I want you to start trying to be on the lookout for those things and trying to find those things. And is it going to maybe feel really superficial at first? Yes, it may. It may be like, well, that's not a big deal. I don't even know why I'm praising myself for that. That's just something you're quote unquote supposed to do. That may be a very common way to think at the beginning of doing an exercise like this, but try to let that way of thinking go and just notice, however small it may be, this is something good that I did today. This is something I feel proud of, or this is something I was thinking about that's a quality I like about myself. And just try it and notice how it feels over time to kind of fake it till you make it with thinking of yourself in a more positive light. Um, the other thing here is that I really think there's a need for some dialectical thinking. So the same way that I just said that I am of the belief that all of us do something well every day, all of us make mistakes every day too. I, again, I just yeah. believe that. <laughs> Find I mean, me evidence <laughs> to the contrary. Um, we do things well and we mess things up. And so I get the sense that you're focusing or finding it easier to access and notice the things that you're messing up, which is true for a lot of us. But to really remind yourself of like, it's both. It is both. And any time that you catch yourself, again, kind of, how do, how do you say it? That you guilt trip yourself, you mentally punish yourself really fast and hard. That when you're quick to do that, see if you can follow it up with something else. This is not about turning into a Pollyanna and never noticing your mistakes or, you know, thinking that you've got it all together. This isn't about that, but this is about trying to find more balance in your self-talk and trying to balance out the negative things that you might think about yourself with some things that are more positive because they both exist. You just got to practice looking for the positive. And that's truly a dialectical way of moving through the world, I believe. So that's what I recommend. Um, what about you, Kate? I like all that. I don't have, I have some to add, but a lot of that was really awesome. I, I thumbs up. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, speaking of that last little bit of the email, the, that my brain can't sabotage, uh, harsh though this may seem, the first thing I have in my notes is that there is no such thing. Yep. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> It was just, I, it's such a fucking bummer, but there's no such thing. <laughs> Especially when it's been that ingrained for that long. So mm -hmm. as much as that might seem at first blush, I don't know, hopeless or pessimistic or, you know, all of those things, 
What I'm hoping you'll take from that is to not shit on yourself for the fact that you haven't found a way that your brain doesn't sabotage, right? Because this is a thing I see a lot. Like, why can't I do this right? My brain just fucks it up every time, right? So if you're already prone, pardon me, to guilt tripping yourself or punishing yourself or thinking poorly of yourself. I know I'm yawning again. My God, Michelle, our bodies are just not cooperating today. The <laughs> right? Just don't. This is another place, I guess, where I can see you holding yourself to an unreasonably high standard, and I want that to not happen if I can prevent it. So, you know, the thing that your brain can't sabotage, no such thing. So, not a goal you need to achieve. Because you can't. Mm -hmm. But, there's still hope. Um, a, I do want to say, first of all, this is an incredibly common issue. Um, people... Are, there's a reason that one of my favorite sayings is stop being a dick to yourself. Uh, it's because on average people are dicks to themselves. Like they're yep. so much nicer to everyone else. Um, also pretty common is to have a, what is known as an external locus of control for good things. As in anytime that something's good is because it was easy or the circumstances were right, or you got lucky or right. Something that has nothing to do with you, your talents or abilities. But the moment something goes wrong, then it's all your fault, right? That's an internal locus of control. I fucked up. I'm stupid. I can't do anything right. I this, right? And so those two things I all also see them come together a lot or coexist a lot in the same clients, right? This both, I'm nice to other people and a dick to myself. Also, anytime I do something good, well, that had nothing to do with me. And whenever I do something bad, that's entirely my fault, right? So I just wanted to mention that to potentially add that layer of awareness for you, especially if you see yourself doing that with the internal and external locus of control, as well as the, I'm kind to other people and a dick to myself. Um, that being said, what can you actually do? Uh, A, I love Michelle's idea of journaling something every day. I make clients, I do it with like something you're proud of every day. Mm -hmm. Um, though similarly with a tiny little low bar, I am proud that I got out of bed today. There's days where that is an absolutely realistic thing to put in that journal entry. <laughs> I showered. Um, you know, anything like that. Something simple. I had a similar idea, but a little bit bigger, just keeping a journal, like a, its own thing that is just, just for achievement. Some of those smaller day-to-day -day things, like practice it day-to-day, -day, and that's awesome, and please acknowledge the small things that you do that are still positive, that are still achievements, that are still something to be proud of. And also, it might help, rather than having to thumb through page after page after page after page after page of daily, <laughs> daily stuff, have one that's just sort of the bigger stuff, the things that maybe you're tempted to be proud of already, if that makes sense. A place that you can turn to to be like, you know what? Look at these things. Like, I have done stuff. Now, the, the writing stuff down every day, like Michelle's talked about, I would keep that an internal process. This other journal or whatever document you want to keep, it doesn't have to be a journal, however you want to label these things. Um, I think that's okay to get some help. It sounds like your husband is more aware of you and your achievements sometimes than you are. So he could help, right, with brainstorming stuff that could go on here. This also doesn't have to be a thing that's only from this moment forward. This could be stuff you look back into your past to record into here, right? It's just a thing that you can look at to remind yourself. Like, look, no matter what I'm saying to myself, like, I have, I have things to be proud of. I have achievements. I have things that I've accomplished. And here's a place I can turn to to look at those. Um, a little bit more, you know, for the, some of the bigger stuff that may have gone on in your life. Uh, and last but not least, I'm trying to think of how well to describe this. This is actually a practice from um, internalized oppression as a therapeutic model, which is to come up with contradictions to your internal narrative, essentially. Your internal distress tapes is what they call it. This is hard to do by yourself. If you have a therapist, this is something you might be able to work on with them. Your husband may actually be able to help with this, but find something that's in direct contradiction to these. And not like to a day-to-day -day thing, not like, uh, I don't know, the mistake I made today doesn't matter that much. Right? That's probably not gonna hit home that much. It's a small enough issue. Something more like, no matter how much I fuck up, I'm still a worthy and deserving person. 
right? Something bigger like that, right? Something maybe along the lines of, I don't know, I've, I've had real accomplishments in my life and I deserve to feel proud, right? Something, something bigger. And the point is to say those statements out loud in the presence of someone you trust, that maybe you find it hard to say it because it doesn't feel true. <laughs> um, if you've found a really good one, a really good contradiction, pretty common responses are to be unable to say it and instead to be laughing hysterically, um, to be unable to say it and instead burst into tears, uh, to be unable to say it and start yawning uncontrollably. Um, and thank goodness for myself, because I have a hard time with people doing this in my presence. No offense to anyone. It's just a thing for me. Uh, the worst case scenario I've ever heard of is if it's a good enough contradiction, people have vomited. Um, rare though, but just as preparation. Anyway, right, find something like that and do it with making eye contact, right, with in this case, perhaps your husband, because I don't know who else is in your life that's really supportive, right? But saying these things or trying to say these things while grounded and while making eye contact um, with your partner could start to do some of the work of, well, yeah, contradicting those internal narratives and helping to break them down. So those are my ideas. Cool. All right. The next one says, hi, y'all. I'm a new listener. I recently got out of a really horrible relationship. To set the scene, we both met in residential therapy and we both had BPD. Sounds like a recipe for disaster, right? Well, it was. I'm not sure what I'm expecting out of this email, but I guess I'm looking at how to navigate relationships while having BPD. Our relationship went really well at first and then really bad. I was getting better and they were remaining stagnant. It was a lot of dependency. They relied on me to eat, take meds, and to do just about everything. It's really hard to come to the realization that someone will never be what you need them to be. I said a lot of things I regret when I broke up with them, and I've been ruminating on it for weeks. I don't want there to be this feeling of hate or anger towards one another. I'm not sure what to do after you split on someone because it doesn't happen to me too much, but when it does, it's nasty. Thanks, y'all, for taking the time to read this. I listen to your podcast at work, and it really helps put things into perspective. Aw, I really love hearing things like that last bit, so thank you, listener. Um, and, let's see. So the first thing that occurred to me was, <laughs> gosh, I can't remember how long ago this was, Michelle, but it was one of our monthly episodes, I think. Let me see if I can find it while you're talking. Okay. Anyway, we did an episode that focused on the experience of when you're changing and someone you're close to isn't, right? This this sense of, I, I think you put it that way, right? That you were you were progressing and they were remaining stagnant, Yeah, that was right? our March monthly episode. So it was released okay. on March 31st. Right, so you might want to take a listen at that one if you haven't gotten to it yet, since you say you're a new listener. That could be helpful. I know that that's not you're not in this relationship anymore, but it may help you put some of what happened in that relationship in perspective, and it could give you some tools for moving forward if you find yourself in a similar position again. Um, then I was thinking about your part where you say that you said a lot of things that you regret, you've been ruminating on it, and you don't want to have there be this feeling of hate or anger towards one another. <sighs> I whiffle waffle on this one, but the closest thing I can think of action-wise would be maybe say what you need in a letter, right? In some sort of written format to give to the person. But, big but, really look at what would you gain. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm also not flat out saying it's a good one. It requires some introspection, right? Are you doing this because you feel like your behaviors are out of alignment with yourself? You're out of integrity with yourself and you want to sort of correct the record so that you're back in alignment with yourself and with your own integrity? Cool. If you're doing it to make the other person feel or not feel any specific way. Meh. Right? If you're doing it with the hope of eliciting some specific response from the other person, eh, not, right? like anything that's other focused, right, is probably 
not going to be the best place to be coming from and maybe means that that letter doesn't need to be written. If it's internally focused, right? I need to do this so that I feel right with myself and I don't need or expect anything from this other person in order for me to get what I need out of this. Then writing it could be a thing, right? Um, that could be helpful. So that's one, one idea. Now, either way, whether you write the letter or not, I do think that DBT-wise, potentially distress tolerance and radical acceptance might be sort of the skill families to look into. I know Michelle's going to talk a little bit more about distress tolerance in her response, so I'll leave that one kind of be and more focus on radical acceptance. I don't even know how to put this. With You are where you are. And it sucks. And it's still where you are. Right? And so this... I don't know. I think one of the one of the things that can come from radical acceptance that I think can be one of the best things from radical acceptance is recognizing the uh, immutability of the past. No matter how much you think about it, no matter how much you beat yourself up about it, no matter how much you wish or hope that it would have gone differently or could have gone differently, uh, it didn't. It went how it went, and that's done now. Right? We can't. We can't rewrite. Re can't rewrite history. And so sometimes, really digging in, really settling into radically accepting that that's what happened. And this is where you are can actually do a lot to help you move forward from that place right there's sometimes we're prevented from moving forward we're sort of stuck in a particular emotional loop because we haven't actually accepted uh you know not to impugn anyone's intelligence it's not that i think anybody listening including the person who wrote this email actually thinks they have the the ability to go back and change the past. But it doesn't have to be a rational thought for some part of our sort of unconscious selves to be clinging to that. Mm -hmm. Right? It doesn't It doesn't have to be you literally believe in time travel. <laughs> it just has to be that you, you haven't accepted it yet. There's some part of you that's still holding on to that wish um, that it could be different. And uh, the sad fact of the matter is it can't. It can't be different. You can do things differently moving forward, but the past is done and you are where you are. So that I think could be really helpful, especially just in you talking about that rumination, right? No amount of going back over it and over it and over it is going to change it, change the impact it had on you or on your ex-partner. Mm -hmm. And using all that time and energy with rumination can actually do a lot to prevent you from moving forward and healing from the relationship. So those are my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I'll start first because you were just talking about the rumination piece. And the biggest thing that came to mind for me with that is to use accepts. Um, specifically from accepts, if I had to pull a couple of those, I think finding an activity for the A that really draws you in. Um, especially if you can maybe find something, I don't know, I kind of want to say like bigger, if you can find a place to go that you really like, a thing to do that maybe you don't get to do all that often, an experience that is out of your normal daily routine and really make some time and space for you to go do an activity that you love, that may help decrease some rumination to just really kind of like get out of the house and go do something fun that might be really distracting for you. Also the C with contributing, that may be helpful for you in big or small doses is to look for opportunities um, to just really notice that there's ways to connect with other people in your life. That could be something that's very distracting when we are with other people and specifically looking for a way to, um, if they need it, and if it's within our own boundaries of what we're comfortable giving, to find a way to contribute to someone else. And again, even just having a phone conversation, like let's just talk about how we're each doing, can be a way of contributing, but can kind of get you outside of you 
to be connecting with someone else. So those might be some elements from accepts that might be able to help with the rumination a little bit. Um, but, you know, I hear this part at the beginning when you say, I'm not sure what I'm expecting out of this email, but I guess I'm looking at how to navigate relationships while having BPD. So looking ahead to your next relationship, whenever it may come, I believe, and Kate and I were talking about this before recording this episode, so I feel confident in saying what I'm about to say. Kate also believes <laughs> that that it's really important. You don't have to do this like on a first date or <laughs> the first time you're talking with someone. You don't have to lay everything out on the table about your life, but at some point um, in your next relationship, it will early be- Early on-ish? Yeah, yeah, early on-ish. Um, would be to disclose that you are diagnosed with BPD and what that may look like for you. I don't know if this happened with you and your ex. I wouldn't be surprised just given how the two of you met that there was maybe just kind of this assumption of like, we both get each other, right? We're both in therapy. We both have BPD. We don't really need to talk about it. <laughs> maybe. I can't say if that's what actually happened between the two of you. Sometimes, though, that can happen with two people where they meet and it's like, hey, you struggle with that too? Oh, so we just understand each other. <laughs> and you may struggle with it in totally different ways. And especially the likelihood may be that the next partner you find does not have a BPD diagnosis, maybe has never heard of BPD, doesn't know what it is or how it can show up. And it will be really important for you to talk about it. I think that's one of the biggest things when it comes to relationship navigation and having any kind of mental health diagnosis is making sure that your partner has an understanding of what that means and how that impacts you. The good, the bad, the ugly. What does that mean for you that you have a BPD diagnosis and how that shows up in your life? So it'll be really important to have an open, honest conversation about it. Kate was also saying before we started recording, um, I don't think you use this term, but I think you were also kind of viewing it as like <laughs> gatekeeping a little bit, like oh, notice yeah. how that person responds. Are they open and willing to like learning more and understanding more? Or are they kind of like, okay, then I'm out in that case. Um, it can tell you a lot about the person you're pursuing um, and being in a relationship with, with how they react to you sharing this with them. So, so that is really, really important. Um, but I think something else that's going to be really important for you here, in addition to everything that Kate was talking about, which I 100% agree with, but I really just kind of sense that you are kicking yourself and beating yourself up for how this relationship ended. And as Kate said, we can't go back. We can't undo it. It is over with. You can recognize that it wasn't the healthiest relationship. And now I think it's really about you being able to have some self-compassion for yourself of recognizing that you did the best that you could do in this relationship. We are all doing the best we can at all times. And sometimes we look back at ourselves and we're like, oh my God, I was doing what? <laughs> like I was a mess, <laughs> you know, how was I doing that? You were doing your best at that time. Given the circumstances, you were doing the best you could do then. And even if now you're perhaps in a position to do better or to do differently, don't be too hard on your past self for how you were responding then. So um, in terms of what this can look like to really practice some mindful self-compassion, I mean, I always, <laughs> I go to this one a lot of just the mindful self-compassion break, right? Which is that you just say to yourself, this is a moment of suffering. Others have suffered just as I am suffering. May I be kind to myself? Just that. And for so many people, I mean, a lot of people have been in this boat where you were in a relationship it ended and you have a lot of regret and you're like, Ooh, I wish I had done this differently or this didn't go well or that kind of a thing. You're not alone. You are not alone. And 
I hope for you, listener, that your experiences in this relationship gave you a lot of lessons to take forward into whatever relationship you find next. Um, so that's what I hope for. And in the meantime, I think it, it is just going to be a lot of recognizing I was doing the best I could in that relationship and now I'm just going to try to do the best that I can being out of this relationship, being single again, trying to recover and be on my own. I just maybe it's so cliche, but it really is true. I'm just really going to try to take it one day at a time and figure out what I can do each day that's going to be kind to myself because yeah, beating yourself up and like Kate was talking about, thinking about what you could change. Uh, it's not not going to get you very far. It's a whole lot more effective to be able to say, what did I learn from this experience, however awful and bad it was? What did I learn? And now what do I do with that new knowledge to continue growing? Yeah. Okay. On to the last one. Last one. Yes. All right, this one says, I have six weeks left of DBT. For one year, I have not missed a single session of group one time a week and individual therapy two times a week. I am so sick over the fact that I found a treatment that worked and it's coming to an end. How can I use dialectical thinking to see the good in this? Hmm. Yeah, well, first of all, good for you, listener. I mean, that's a big, big, big accomplishment to be that committed to your personal growth and to the dbt program you were in i mean that's amazing so good job um and you know the most common dialectic that i think about is this term bittersweet that's a dialectic right there and a lot of times when we're using that term bittersweet we are referring to endings um and so this is an ending in your life, right? Your DBT program is coming to an end and there's probably something very bitter about that and there's probably something a little bit sweet about it too. And so I would look at that for yourself. What are the things that I feel really sad about? What are the things that I'm going to miss? And what are the things that are maybe almost good about my time ending in this program. Um, it may be a lot easier right now with the state of mind you're in to think more of the bitter than the sweet, but there's a little bit of both. And I just want to really validate too that it makes sense to have grief around this and to have a lot of fear around this. I mean, this is something that Kate and I will hear when we do groups, which, you know, we we don't work with people as intensively as the as the group that you did, right? We lead we lead different modules in eight week chunks. But even people after you know going through one of the modules and being in a group for eight weeks, sometimes are like, well, now what? Uh, what do I do? Because we take the summer off from our groups. Mm. What am I going to do over the summer before the next one? <laughs> or that that sort of an idea. People can have a lot of fear around what happens when I don't have this structure in my life. Will I just backslide? What's, what's going to happen? But the way to really combat that fear is to make a plan for how you're going to continue to use your skills. So now it's kind of on you. This is essentially the equivalent of like, I don't know, the training wheels are off the bike. <laughs> or if you've been in driver's ed and you've only driven with an instructor of the car with you, but now you're driving for the first time alone. You know, it's kind of the equivalent of those sorts of experiences where now you're more independent. And so it is kind of on you to figure out what's my plan to keep DBT present in my life. How am I going to do that? That's a big reason why Kate and I want to make the podcast is so that we could be one way that people could do that is by listening to, you know, podcast episodes and recalling and remembering to use the skills in that way. But are you going to get a workbook? Are you going to... um you know, I don't know. We just recorded an episode about this a couple months ago, the using DBT skills in daily life. I would really mm. encourage you to listen to that episode if you haven't already, because we talk about exactly this of after you're done with the group or when you're actually trying to apply the stuff that you're, you know, conceptually learning in DBT and then you want to actually do it. 
what does that look like? So create a plan for yourself and hopefully that will combat some of the, any fear that may be coming up for you. Um, the other thing too that might really be helpful is seeing if there's any way that you can stay connected with other people in your group if you'd like that. Um, a lot of times for me, when I've been really worried about endings, don't get me wrong, there are things in life that are true endings. You will never be able to go back to that place. You will never be able to see or talk to those people again. There are things like that that happen in life. Far more often, though, it doesn't have to be a full ending if you don't want it to be. Hopefully, there is an option to keep in touch with people if you'd like to keep in touch with people in some way so that you can stay connected with them. If you decide, you know, take, I would encourage you, take some time off from doing a group and, you know, individual therapy this intensively. Take some time off from that. But, you know, if let's say a year from now, you're like, hey, I want to do a DBT group again. You could probably find one and do a group again if you want to have a group experience in the future, if you think you are needing that support down the line. A lot of times, I guess what I'm trying to say, endings are not truly endings. It doesn't mean it's like for sure over. If you want to continue in some way to stay connected with the people you met or to keep doing the work that you were doing, there likely might be a way. So it's ending in its current form, but it might be able to keep going. And I literally just looked down at Kate's notes and that is something she's going to talk about. So I'm going to stop now. Um, I said all of my points and I don't want to take away from what you're going to say. <laughs> well, that's funny. I, I don't know. Uh, not in a you took it away kind of way, but you like, take it away, Michelle. No, you uh, you said most of what I And would, I think we right? even acknowledged before we recorded, yes. like we each typed our notes for this one and we're like, we're both going to say the same things just in our own just in our own way. So that's yep. my take. Now you get Kate's take, which probably <laughs> won't be that probably won't be as different. long because Michelle really did cover most of it. But right, it is the same the same idea, right? This this phase or this particular experience of DBT, this way of interacting with DBT is done or may be done. Right. As Michelle said, some people redo a similar thing. Of uh, the DBT group that I went through, lots of people just started the group again and <laughs> did it back to back uh, when I was a client myself, right? But let's just assume it is done. As Michelle was pointing out, DBT can continue in your life in a lot of different forms, right? Our podcast was designed to do that. Um, there are other podcasts, there are other books, there are, um, you know, staying in touch with the people from your group. There are just your own sort of self-led programs, if that makes sense. Not self-led program, but do you want to create your own diary card or copy the one and keep yourself on it, right? Do you want to take yourself through it with a workbook? Like, how do you want DBT to be in your life moving forward? And I think that might be a way to shift your focus is, you know, obviously sadness, grief, fear, all of those are appropriate for this. And a great counterbalance to those things is anticipation. So if you can start to think to yourself, all right, like if this phase is ending, what do I want it to look like? How do I want DBT to continue to show up in my life? What other forms do I want to engage in? And start building something you can look forward to, right? Something you're like, well, I am sad that this is going on and I'm excited to try this new adventure. I'm excited to set off on this new phase of my journey. Wow, that sounded really self-helpy, that last phrase there. Uh, <laughs> and it's also true. It's also true, but also <laughs> bleh. Uh, <laughs> right? And another way that might help you move on is, right, we're talking about sadness being appropriate, but... Also, pride and gratitude are appropriate at the ending of something like this that has done so much for you. You might take some time to focus in on those things, right? If DBT has worked this well for you, I feel very comfortable saying you have worked DBT. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, it's wonderful that you haven't missed a single session. And also, people cannot miss a single session 
and get fuck all from it because they're not doing anything between sessions. They're not really present during the sessions other than physically, right? Like, the, but it sounds like you, listener, you were engaged. You were doing this. You were getting everything you could out of the experience. And that, that's worth being proud of. That's effort. That's investment in yourself. And it's hard. Learning these new skills, implementing these new skills, right? Dedicating yourself to, what is it sounds like, th minimum of three, maybe four hours a week, depending on how long your group sessions are. Um, right? That's a lot of dedicated time and energy. And depending on where you are in the country, possibly money. Um, or in the world. Um, right? So you're invested in you. So have some pride in that. Uh, and also gratitude. Right? And this gratitude can be pointed in so many ways. Maybe this gratitude in part is for the fact that you're somewhere where these kinds of programs are accessible. Maybe gratitude for the people who led your groups or your individual therapist. Uh, gratitude for your fellow group members and whatever they brought to the group that was unique because they were the people in it. Um, gratitude to yourself, right? Right next to that pride. <laughs> also having gratitude towards yourself for the fact that you decided to invest in this. Um, gratitude, I mean, so many different things for DBT, for its existence, for the fact that it's so helpful, right? For the improvements that you've seen happen over the course of the year you've been doing it, right? Just really, I think I've said this a lot this time. Apparently the idea of leaning in is very, very in my brain today, uh, <laughs> right? But when I say focusing on it, it, I don't mean to say focus on the pride and gratitude to the exclusion of the sadness and grief, because that wouldn't be appropriate either, um, because the sadness and grief have their place. Um, but just to balance the scales a bit, right? You talked about dialectical thinking, and that's that's where I see this as fitting in, um, is to remember, yeah, that even, like, as a part of its ending, pride and gratitude are are places that you might find to balance that out on the other half of the dialectic of it being sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are kind of my ways I would state it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, so that's the end of this Q&A. So if you guys have emails you want to send us, DBTME podcast at gmail.com is where you can direct those our way. And if you're part of the Facebook group, keep posting in the Facebook group. Um, we have many more Q and A's already lined up with lots of content ready to go. Thanks to you all being really active and engaged with, yeah, sending emails, posting in the group, all of it. And we have to build off of what Kate was talking about with gratitude. We have a lot of gratitude for you all. So, all right. Thank you for that. Kate just, I'm calling you out. Kate again. just ended like a huge yawn. So I was trying to <laughs> drink it out while I saw you yawning. But thank you guys for being here and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye everyone. To learn more about us and the DBT skills we're teaching each week, join our Facebook group. Simply log in to your Facebook profile and search for D.